Hello, everyone. My name is Brendan Hassett. I'm a professor of mathematics at Brown University and the director of ICERM. ICERM is the Institute for Computational Experimental Research in Mathematics. We're funded by the National Science Foundation to promote research in the mathematical sciences. We're one of seven institutes supported by the Division of Mathematical Sciences. Our special emphasis is on the relationship between mathematics and computation. We're interested in how algorithms and uh, programs can, can emerge in mathematical research, but also how computer experiments can lead to new discoveries in mathematics. We're particularly interested in how large data sets and uh, data-oriented discovery can develop new, new results in mathematics and how those results can be proved and, and understood at a conceptual level. So we're really excited to have Daniela Witten tonight to talk to us. So she's a professor of statistics and biostatistics at the University of Washington and a Dorothy Guilford Endowed Chair in Mathematical Biostatistics. She has three degrees from Stanford, both in mathematics and in biology. She's won a long, long list of awards. Um, so she's been recognized by the National Institutes of Health and NSF. Uh, she's a, a fellow of the International Statistical Institute and the American Statistical Association. She's done really important work in uh, applications of statistics to problems in public health. Um, and so she's also been profiled in the media and both um, both Forbes and Elle magazine. And so, so she's, um, you know, she's one of the most visible proponents of how statistical learning can be brought to bear to a wide range of problems. Uh, she's written an important and widely used textbook on that subject. Um, so let me, uh, let me hand it off to Danielle, Daniela Witten. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for the really kind intro and for the opportunity to speak to you all. I'm really excited to tell you all about my work on um, more data, more problems, double dipping in statistics. And so, um, sorry, one sec, I just wanna get my screen sharing right. Um, okay, so this story has to do with the fact that uh, maybe some of you have seen in the news that science is facing a replication crisis. So here's a headline from Vox in 2016 what psychology's crisis means for the future of science. So that sounds really bad. It sounds like in 2016, there was a, a replication crisis in science, I mean, in psychology, but the story actually gets worse because, I'm sorry, my, sorry, there's a little bit of a Zoom problem. All right, well, the story gets worse because in 2018 in Vox, uh, more social science studies failed to replicate. So the problem from 2016 to 2018, the problem went from just psychology to all of social science. And by 2020, all of science actually has a replication crisis. And in fact, it's had one for a decade. So it's clear that there's a problem. Um, and whenever there's a, a story like this, it's nice to have a villain. And for many people, the villain in the story is the p-value. So uh, what's the p-value? Well, I'm gonna talk about it a little bit more as a review for those of you who have maybe forgotten it from your long ago stats 101 class. Um, but as we'll see, a p-value is a bit of an unusual villain. Uh, maybe it's not the right villain to have at all. And maybe we need to instead be rethinking a little bit about how we do our data analyses. But first, what do I mean when I say that the p-value is the villain of the story? Um, well, here is a, an editorial that came out in the Journal of Basic and Applied Social Psychology in 2015. Um, so this is written by the editors of that journal. Um, okay, so um, this is like a snippet of the editorial and it's, it says um, the null hypothesis significance testing procedure, abbreviated NHSTP, and null hypothesis significance testing, for those who aren't familiar, that's like a term that typically non-statisticians use to refer to hypothesis testing and p-values. So the null hypothesis significance <laughs> testing procedure is invalid. <laughs> the Journal of Basic and Applied Social Psychology is banning null hypothesis significance testing. And I really like question one here. Will manuscripts with p-values be desk rejected automatically? And the answer is no. However, prior to publication, authors will have to remove all vestiges of NHST from the manuscript. So this really gives you the idea that p-values must be very, very bad um, if they're going to be actually entirely banned from a journal. Um, so yeah, p-values are bad. Here's actually a, a journal article, an editorial rather, in the, in the Journal of Osteoarthritis and Cartilage that literally says why the p-value culture is bad. Um, interestingly, this, this editor says that 
confidence intervals are better. And that's very interesting to me as a statistician, because of course, as I'll talk about in more detail in a couple of minutes, there's a duality between p-values and confidence intervals. So if you like one, uh, you should like the other. And, and if you don't, you don't. Um, but this isn't limited to this Journal of Basic and Applied Psychology and the Journal of Osteoarthritis and Cartilage. Here's a piece in, in the journal Biology Letters that says the reign of the p-value is over. Um, the p-value is now widely recognized as being easily misinterpreted. And actually, this is a point that I won't disagree with. It's certainly true that a lot of people misinterpret or misunderstand p-values. And I think maybe my favorite example of this is this, this piece that was published in Nature actually describing that p-value band that I mentioned in the psychology journal. Um, it has a really funny correction. Um, and the, the first sentence says this, of the correction, the story originally asserted that the closer to zero the p-value gets, the greater the chance that the null hypothesis is false. And in fact, that's not at all what a p-value is telling you. Um, so indeed, I, I agree that psychology or rather the p-values are hard to understand for some people sometimes and even nature gets it wrong. So as I think maybe you can anticipate, um, I agree that we have problems with um, replication, with a replication crisis in science. I don't think that p-values are the villain. I think it's important to um, not blame p-values because if we tilt at windmills, then we're going to miss our opportunity to actually solve what might be a real problem. Um, so instead, let's let's understand what the problem is and let's see how we can fix it um, without coming up with a, uh, a scapegoat that isn't actually going to solve our problems. Okay, so first of all, what is a p-value? And I know many of you remember your previous statistics classes very well, um, but some of you might not. And so briefly, I just want to bring us all onto the same page. So the idea is we want to test some null hypothesis, which we can call H0. And H0 is like our default state of belief about the world. Um, and what we want to do is, is test this null hypothesis using data. So to do this first, we're going to define a test statistic T that summarizes the extent to which the data are consistent with the null hypothesis. And then we're going to calculate the probability under the null hypothesis of seeing at least as large of a value of the test statistic as the one that we saw. So T OBS is the value of the test statistic on our observed data. OBS stands for observed. And capital T is just a random variable representing the test statistic. And so we want to know the probability that that random variable exceeds T OBS under the null distribution H naught, under the null hypothesis H naught. And here within that probability, I have um, absolute values because in this example, I care about the the probability of seeing a test statistic that's as large as T OBS or as small as negative T OBS. Um, but if I only care about a deviation in one direction, then I don't need an absolute value sign. So this probability is known as the p-value. And, and basically, if this p-value is small, then that's telling me that I'm unlikely to see such a large value of the test statistic by chance if the null distribution holds. And so therefore, a small p-value provides evidence against the null hypothesis. OK. Um, so here's an example. So let's say that I want to test the null hypothesis that some parameter mu is zero, where to make things simple, maybe we have a random variable x um, that's normally distributed, and mu is the mean parameter, it has variance one. And so I get n iid, independent, identically distributed realizations of x, and then I can define a test statistic, which is just um, a scaling of the sample mean of x. And then it's not hard to show that under the null hypothesis, T has a normal zero one distribution. So to get a p-value, it's pretty straightforward to just calculate the probability of a normal zero one random variable being at least as large as the value of the T statistic that I observed on my data. Um, so here's an example on the x-axis, I'm showing you the value of the test statistic. And this in yellow is the probability density function of a normal zero one random variable. Um, my observed test statistic is 2.33 in this example that's shown in blue. So to calculate a p-value, I just need to calculate the fraction of the yellow, null, the yellow normal zero one distribution that falls to the right of the blue line. And then to make this a two-sided p-value, if I care about both a, a test statistic that's greater than what I observed and a test statistic that's less than the negative of what I observed, then I also need to calculate the portion of the yellow distribution that's to the to the left of the negative 2.33 line. And it turns out that 1% of the normal 01 distribution falls to the right of the blue line, and another 1% of the normal 01 distribution falls to the left of negative 
So the p-value is just 0.01 plus 0.01 or 0.02. Okay, so that's what a p-value is. Um, hopefully it feels pretty innocuous to you. Um, but we should think a little bit about what we use p-values for. So we use p-values to decide whether or not to reject the null hypothesis. And so typically, if the p-value is less than some number alpha, then we're going to reject the null hypothesis. In other words, we'll decide that based on the data, um, we think that the null hypothesis probably doesn't hold. And we choose alpha to be a small number, um, like maybe it's 0.05 or 0.01 or 0.001. It's up to us to choose alpha. And we can think about like our hypothesis test is really having to do with the two by two table, which is shown here. So the rows of this table tell us what decision we made. Either we rejected the null hypothesis or we didn't reject the null hypothesis. And those are the rows of this table. And then the columns tell us the true state of the world. Either the null hypothesis holds, so that's the column marked H naught, or the null hypothesis doesn't hold, and that's marked H sub A, where A stands for alternative. So the alternative hypothesis is just whatever the null hypothesis isn't. So we know if we decide, once we've test the hypothesis, we know which row we're in because we know whether or not we rejected the null hypothesis, but we don't know which column we're in. If we knew which column we're in, we would know whether the null hypothesis holds, and then we wouldn't need to do a hypothesis test. So we know what row we're in, but not which column we're in. So if we end up over here, then over here, the null hypothesis holds and we didn't reject it. And so that's really great. We made the right decision. Or if we're over here, now the null hypothesis doesn't hold and we rejected the null hypothesis. So that's really good too. We are happy. Um, but as a statistician, what I really don't wanna do is be over here. And this corresponds to the scenario where the null hypothesis holds but I rejected the null hypothesis. So if we think about like the principle um, of the American law that um, you're innocent until proven guilty, then we can think about like if the null hypothesis is that the defendant is innocent, then this, type, this little box here, which is marked as a type one error, that corresponds to the idea that the defendant is innocent, but I rejected the null hypothesis. In other words, I found them guilty. And we really don't want to be in a situation where we're finding an innocent person guilty. We don't want to convict an innocent person of a crime. And that's why a type one error is, is really bad. And this is the scenario that we want to avoid. So when we think about hypothesis testing, we're structuring it about, around avoiding type one errors. And the key point is that if we reject the null hypothesis when the p-value is below some number alpha that we choose, then our type one error rate will be bounded by alpha, bounded above by alpha. And we refer to this as type one error rate control. We say that the type one error rate is controlled by alpha or is controlled at alpha. Okay, so that's really the connection between like the, the p-value and then this, this table. So the smaller the alpha that we use in order to reject our null hypothesis, um, the smaller our type one error rate is gonna be where again, the type one error rate is the probability of a false rejection. The probability of sending an innocent person to jail. Okay, so now some people say, as you saw that the title from that um, editorial that I showed a screenshot of a few minutes ago, some people say, well, you know, we shouldn't use p-values, p-values are villains, we should use confidence intervals instead. And this is sort of a bit bizarre as a stance because there's a duality between confidence intervals and p-values. So let's say that we have some parameter mu that equals zero, or we want, to, we want to know whether a parameter mu equals zero. Um, and so we collect some data and we estimate the parameter mu, call it mu hat, and maybe mu hat is negative 1.14. And then we construct a 95% confidence interval around mu hat. So this 95% confidence interval has the property that 95% um, of confidence intervals constructed in this way on data realizations will cover the true parameter. And it turns out that there's a duality where the one minus alpha confidence interval, so for example, the 95% confidence interval covers mu equals zero if and only if the p-value for the null hypothesis that mu equals zero is larger than alpha. So for example, here, if you look at that confidence interval, if that's a 95% confidence interval, then I know that the p-value for the null hypothesis that mu equals zero is actually gonna be less than alpha because the confidence interval doesn't contain zero. And by contrast, this is a much wider confidence interval. Now this confidence interval contains zero. So I know that the p-value for h not mu equals zero is gonna be greater than alpha. Um, 
So the point is that there's a duality between confidence intervals and p-values. Um, I'm going to talk in this talk about what can go wrong when we think about um, computing p-values on big data and how we can fix it. And so please don't come away from this talk thinking that the problem is p-values and that you can just use confidence intervals and, and skip a whole bunch of trouble because there's a direct duality and, and any problem that a p-value does or doesn't have will be shared by the corresponding confidence interval. Okay, so that was just a quick reminder about p-values. So now back to the replication crisis, um, who or what is to blame for it? Um, I don't think that p-values are the villain, um, but there must be a reason that some people think that p-values are. So what is actually going on here? And I think that what's going on here is that there's a disconnect between the theory of data analysis and the practice. So what we write in our textbooks and what we tell our students is that before you even look at your data, you should have a plan. You should plan some small number of hypothesis tests that you're going to conduct, and then you should stick to your plan. And it's very easy to tell someone that this is what they should do. No, pro no problem, it's, talk is cheap. Um, but in practice, this isn't what, what people do, and it's not even what we do when we analyze our own data. In practice, we tend to test a lot of hypotheses on our data. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, which I'll talk about today. But the, the first one that I wanna talk about is simply just that the larger your data set is, the more hypotheses that you can think of testing. So um, one very canonical example of this has to do with um, gene expression data. So this, this figure sort of has a lot going on, but this is a very canonical example of a gene expression data set where this big rectangle that you're seeing in red and in blue um, is a heat map. So that's just like a, a visual representation of a data matrix where a red indicates a value that's very large around 10 and a, a blue indicates a, a small value around negative 10. Whites represent zeros. And so this is a data matrix containing gene expression values for a number of tissue samples. So the columns in this heat map represents tissue samples, each of which is derived from a different patient with breast cancer. And the rows represent 50 genes. And each element represents the expression value. So basically the amount that a particular gene is turned on or off in this particular tissue sample. And so on the basis of this data, one thing that you might wanna do is test for every single one of these 50 genes, the extent to which the gene's expression is associated with, let's say, um, subtype of breast cancer or um, survival time and so on. So on the basis of a data set like this, it's very easy to imagine testing 50, 100, 150, really a huge number of hypotheses. And furthermore, in this little example here, there's only 50 genes, but of course, like you're, you actually have 25,000 genes. Um, and we could come up with all sorts of increasingly complicated hypotheses to test. So it's very easy to imagine that on the basis of even just one data set, we might be testing huge numbers of hypotheses. Um, here's another example. This one is taken from neuroimaging. So you can imagine doing brain scans of a bunch of um, study participants. Maybe some of them have had strokes and some of them have, ha have not. And we could look um, to identify brain regions that differ between those who have and haven't had strokes. Um, and we can see right away that um, there's going to be a lot of possible brain regions where we could possibly see differences between the patients with and without strikes, strokes. And so very quickly, we're gonna end up conducting a ton of hypothesis tests. Okay, so what's the problem with conducting a ton of hypothesis tests? Well, it's really well summarized by this XKCD comic. So we have someone running up to a scientist and saying jelly beans cause acne. So the scientists go and they, they run some study and then they say, we found no link between jelly beans and acne, P greater than 0.05. Okay. And then the scientists continue. We found no link between purple jelly beans and acne, low link between brown jelly beans and acne, no link between pink jelly beans and acne, and so on. They test association between 20 colors of jelly bean and acne. But if you look very carefully, they actually did find a link between green jelly beans and acne, P less than 0.05. So then the headline in the newspaper the next day is that green jelly beans are linked to acne. So of course something went wrong. Um, and the thing that went wrong is that um, a whole bunch of hypotheses were tested and somehow this wasn't accounted for in the analysis. Okay, so what actually happened here? Well, we need to go back to this table, but now let's think about the same table that we had before, but instead of testing one hypothesis, we're gonna test M hypotheses. Um, 
where in the jelly bean example, maybe M equals 20, but in the context of gene expression data, M could easily be 20,000 or, or much more. Um, and now each element of the table is the number of hypotheses for which, for example, the null hypothesis is true, but we rejected the null hypothesis. And the family-wise error rate is the probability that V in this table is greater than or equal to one. So it's the probability of making at least one false rejection. And so often when we think about testing a whole bunch of hypotheses, we want to avoid any false rejections. Again, if we think about the null hypothesis as, the, as um, corresponding to a defendant being innocent, then that's saying we want to av avoid falsely convicting anybody who's actually innocent. So the problem is that if we have M null hypotheses and they're all true, and furthermore, the test statistics associated with those hypotheses are independent, then the family-wise error rate is just one minus the probability of no false rejections, which is just one minus the intersection of the probability of not falsely rejecting the Jth null hypothesis. And that's just one minus one minus alpha to the M if alpha is the type one error rate or the probability of falsely rejecting any single null hypothesis. So we can see that when M is big, even if alpha is small, one minus one minus alpha to the M might actually end up being very large. And so we can see the problem actually in this figure where on the x-axis is the number of hypotheses we're testing. And on the y-axis is the family-wise error rate. The, the 0 0.05, 0 0.05 is shown as the horizontal dashed line. And what we see in the three colors are the family-wise error rate for three different values of alpha. So if you, if you use alpha equals 0 0.05, in other words, if you control the type one error rate for any single null hypothesis at 0 0.05, then if you test enough null hypotheses, eventually actually by the time you test like 50 null hypotheses, your family-wise error rate is almost one. You can see that in the orange line. Um, if you test 50 hypotheses using a, a type one error rate of 0 0.001, then you have a very modest family-wise error rate of 0.05 once you've tested 50 null hypotheses. Um, but if you use alpha equals 0.01, you're almost never gonna be able to reject the null hypothesis. So you're not gonna have a lot of you know, power to make any discoveries in your data. So this is really the problem that arises when we test a lot of hypotheses. Um, so there are of course strategies to fix this that have been around for decades. So the best known strategy is called the Bonferroni correction. And the way that this works is that we notice that the family-wise error rate, um, it's the probability that V is greater than or equal to one. So that's just the union of the probability of falsely rejecting the Jth null hypothesis over J null hypotheses. And so the union is less than, of the probability is less than or equal to the sum of probabilities using the union inequality. And so what that means is that if we just bound the type one error for each individual hypothesis at alpha over M, and the overall family-wise error rate will be less than or equal to alpha. And so this is the Bonferroni correction. It tells us that if we wanna just control the overall family-wise error rate, we should reject the null hypothesis if the p-value is less than alpha over m. And this is one strategy we can take, but we don't need to worry about the family-wise error rate. We can think about other quantities like the false discovery rate, which is basically the proportion of false rejections. Um, there's a lot of ways we can deal with multiple testing that are more sophisticated than a Bonferroni correction and that are better in a lot of ways. The only point that I'm trying to make here is that like multiple testing is like very well understood. There are easy fixes and like multiple testing should not be responsible for the replication crisis in science because we know how to, we know how to deal with multiple testing. All right, so why are we having a replication crisis? Well, we definitely can correct for multiple testing when it's obvious. And what I mean by that is we can correct for multiple testing when we know that we've performed multiple testing. And in particular, we can correct for multiple testing when we know how many tests we've performed. Cause like we can just do a Bonferroni correction, for example. Um, but the issue is that actually some types of multiple testing are more subtle. So here's an example of a more subtle type of multiple testing issue. Um, this is known as the file drawer problem. And the idea behind the file drawer problem is imagine a researcher conducts a ton of studies. Um, and for every study, the researcher tests the null hypothesis, uh, but only studies with quote unquote significant results. In other words, researchers where the, excuse me, studies where the researcher was able to reject the null hypothesis and make a discovery are actually gonna be published because no journal is interested in like publishing studies that are like, we 
scale to reject the null hypothesis. Like that's just not terribly interesting usually with, with some exceptions. So we are imagining that the researcher puts all the non-significant studies in a file drawer. And the problem with this is that then the p-values that appear in the literature are gonna be very, very small, but we don't really have a way to account for the fact that multiple testing was actually implicitly performed by putting all of the larger p-values in a file drawer. And this is actually a hard problem because we need some way to adjust the p-values that are in the published literature for the fact that there's a whole bunch of other p-values that were never published that are sitting in file drawers. So here's another example of how multiple testing can be more subtle. Um, this actually is a paper that I just saw a couple of days ago um, and it was sent to me by a researcher in the Brown community, um, Orestes Panajotu. And I thought this is an interesting example of like how multiple testing can kind of arise in an insidious way. And it has to do with the fact that, um, it, that it is becoming increasingly common to collect really large scale health data from administrative claims, from electronic medical records, from disease registries and so on. And once these routinely collected health data are available, a ton of researchers can use these data sets to test a ton of hypotheses. Um, and there's really like no accountability among the researchers for the fact that a ton of different questions and a ton of hypotheses were tested on the basis of the single data set. So there's really no ability to perform multiple testing correction, even within a single data set. So like the issue with the file drawer problem is, you know, you have a hundred data sets and then only five results are public, excuse me. Yeah, a hundred data sets and only five results are published for five of those data sets. But here the idea is we have a single data set, but if a lot of researchers investigate it and ask a lot of questions, uh, we're not correcting for that multiple testing either. Um, but what I actually wanna focus on for the rest of my time today is a, is a different way in which multiple testing can be subtle. And this has to do with the fact that, um, again, as I mentioned before, in principle, before we, um, analyze our data, we're supposed to know what hypotheses to test and we're supposed to stick to that plan. But what can actually happen in practice and what I would argue typically does happen in practice is that we, we often decide what hypotheses to test after, I look at, after we look at our data. And this is something that it's like kind of like statisticians when they teach courses, they sort of do this bait and switch with their students where like we tell our students that exploratory data analysis is so incredibly important. And then it's always important to like plot your data and like check if the model's a good fit and this and that, and like, you know, project the data onto the first few principal components and like try out some clustering and do all these different things. But we don't give our students a way that they can use what they learned in their exploratory data analysis to actually inform the hypotheses that they test in, without um, running into a multiple testing issue. And so that's what I'm gonna be talking about now. Um, so I'm, I'm going to refer to this problem as double dipping, and some of you might remember this episode from Seinfeld where um, there's a big issue related to the fact that somebody double dipped. They like put a chip into the dip and took a bite and then put the chip back in the dip. And you shouldn't do that because it's not hygienic. And similarly, you shouldn't double dip with your data. Um, and by double dipping with your data, what I mean is generating and testing a null hypothesis on the same data. So if we're going to use our data to generate a null hypothesis, then we just shouldn't test the null hypothesis on that data. And um, unfortunately, that's often hard to do, and it's hard to know how to avoid double dipping. So just to illustrate the point, um, here's some R code, where what I'm doing is I'm generating a data matrix X um, with 25 rows and 100 columns. Or I said that backwards, 25 columns and 100 rows, where the columns represent variables. I also have a vector Y which is just unrelated to X and I fit a linear model. So the model that I'm fitting here just says that Y is a linear combination of the X's plus noise. Um, and here there's no signal in the data. So in reality, Y is unrelated to the X's. And if I fit this model, here's the output that I get in R. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the, the R output of a linear model, here are the P values for the intercept and then for each of the 25 variables. And if you just sort of glance at these p values, you see most of them are like pretty modest. There aren't any that are particularly small. Um, these are p values for the null hypothesis that a particular feature's association with the response is zero. Um, this p value here, just by chance, tends to be like a little bit on the small side. It's 0.0946. I certainly wouldn't want to reject any null hypotheses based on that p value. 
But regardless, I can just, I might look at this analysis and I could say, okay, well, maybe there's something going on with the 25th feature because the 25th feature looks like it might be a little bit associated with the response. And that might motivate me to fit another model where I just use the 25th feature to predict the response. So now in the second model, Y is just equal to beta naught plus beta X25 plus epsilon. And if I fit this model, now I get quite a small p-value, 0.0125. Right, then I'll hypothesis that the 25th feature has no association with the response. Okay, and remember I simulated this data and I know that none of the features have any association with a response. So what's going on here? I sort of fit a model that led me to test a null hypothesis. And then when I test the null hypothesis, I, um, I rejected the null even though I know that the, the null holds. So if something went wrong, and so the thing that went wrong here is that in the second model, we computed the probability that under the null distribution, a test statistic exceeds the value that we observed in the data. But in no way did we account for the fact that the only reason I'm interested in testing this particular null hypothesis involving the 25th feature was because of the results I found in my first model. So there's like nothing about this p-value definition that takes into consideration the fact that the only reason I'm testing this null hypothesis is because I happen to have noticed on the same data that the 25th feature seemed like it was associated with the response. So the consequence for this is that the type one error rate will be too large. If I reject the null hypothesis, the 25th feature has no association with the response. When the p-value is less than alpha, then I'm gonna falsely reject the null hypothesis much more than alpha of the time. So I might innocently think that I'm controlling the type one error rate at level alpha, but I'm not. I'm gonna have like a vastly inflated type one error rate. Okay, so how can we fix this problem? Well, in this particular setting of double dipping for regression, there's, there's sort of a, an obvious option and a less obvious option. So the obvious option has to do with sample splitting. And so the idea behind sample splitting is that I can start with my data shown on the left, and I'm just gonna split the observations at random into a training set and a test set. And then on the training data, I can fit a model where I'm predicting the response using all 25 features. And then on the training data, if I notice that the 25th feature seems like the one that's most associated with the response, then I can fit a model using just the 25th feature to predict the response only on the test data. So the initial model I fit on the training data and then the follow-up model I fit on the test data. And if I do this, the I, when I look at that second model on the test data using only the 25th feature, then everything checks out. This, this works in the sense that the type one error of the null hypothesis test in that second model fit to the test data is gonna be controlled. So everything's okay. So like this works in the sense that my type one error is controlled. It's not necessarily a great strategy because I'm only using half my data. Like uh, to me as a statistician, it's easy to say like, oh yeah, like great, we solved the problem. But if you go to like a biologist who spent like their youth collecting this data set where like every sample had to be like painstakingly collected and run through some you know complicated experimental pipeline. And then I tell them, okay, well now you're gonna split your data into a training and a test set. Like they might not be very happy with this. So it might not like satisfy the scientist but at least it quote unquote works from a statistical perspective. Oh, but we can actually maybe do better. So here's sort of another option for how we can handle this. Um, the idea is that instead of sample splitting, why don't we use all of the data? But let's just change the way that we're defining a p-value. So instead of defining our p-value to be the probability under the null hypothesis of seeing such a large value of the test statistic, let's instead define it to be the probability under the null hypothesis of seeing such a large value of the test statistic, given that this particular feature was the one that was most associated with the response in that first model. So the motivation here is that the reason that I'm interested in testing in this, in this regression example from a couple minutes ago, the reason that I'm interested in testing whether the 25th feature is associated with the response is because I happen to notice that in the big multiple regression model with all 25 features, the 25th feature was the most associated with the response. So when I calculate my p-value, I should calculate the probability of seeing such a large test statistic given that I even decided to ask this question in the first place given whatever it was in the data that made me interested in the 25th feature. And in this case, the reason I was interested in the 25th feature is because it was most associated with the response in the first model. 
And if I, if I develop this new definition of a p-value and I reject the null hypothesis that the 25th feature is unassociated with the response when this p-value is less than alpha, then that'll lead me to falsely reject the null hypothesis no more than alpha of the time. So in other words, I'll get type one error control. So this strategy is known as selective inference. And it has been the topic of a lot of interest in the statistical community in the, in the past um, seven or so years. And what's, what's really the bottom line behind selective inference? Well, the bottom line is that if I wanna test a hypothesis that I've generated using a data set, then I should condition on the aspect of the data that led me to choose this null hypothesis. In other words, if I wanna double dip on my data, then that's actually fine. But any inference that I do on my data needs to be conditional on whatever it was that made me interested in this null hypothesis in the first place. So I've been very interested in the last couple of years in, in the selective inference problem and in trying to understand how can we use ideas in selective inference to like solve problems that we're actually seeing in data analysis across various fields. And so now I'm gonna talk just a little bit about um, some of my group's work in that area. So um, first I'm gonna talk about some of our work on double dipping and clustering. And so clustering of course is a, is a technique that's incredibly important in a lot of areas of science. Um, and in particular, it's really an indispensable um, tool in, in many areas of, of biology and in particular in genomics. Um, so the, the big idea here is that we have some data, which I'm showing on the left. Um, and because it makes it easier to show it on a slide, this data just has two dimensions. So we just have feature one or variable one and variable two. But the idea is that I cluster the data and here I've used hierarchical clustering. So this figure in the middle is a, is a hierarchical clustering dendrogram. And the idea is that we can cut the dendrogram at a particular height in order to get the clusters. So here I have three clusters shown in blue, orange, and green. And then on the right, I'm mapping those cluster labels back to the original data. And so the question that I wanna ask is, okay, so I've done clustering, I've estimated some clusters on my data, and I now wanna know, are the cluster means really different? So is there really a difference between the population mean of the orange and green clusters, or is there no more difference between them than I would expect by chance? So to illustrate the problem, we can just simulate some data. So here I've simulated hundred observations from a normal zero one model. So there's no true clusters here, this is just noise. And then I cluster the observations and I get a blue, a green, and an orange cluster. And now I can compute p-values for a difference in means. So compute like, um, test whether or not there's a difference between the, the mean of the blues and the mean of the oranges, the mean of the blues and the mean of the greens and so on. But if I do this, I find that all three p-values are really tiny. They're less than 10 to the negative six. So, okay, what's happening here? Well, this is a little weird um, because I know that there's no true mean clusters in my data, right? I simulated the data from a normal zero one model, but I can see right away what the problem is. And the problem is that I clustered the data. And by doing that, I was like literally looking for a way to color the observations so that the blues would look as different from the greens and as different from the oranges as possible. So of course, after I do that, if I just like run a hypothesis test for a difference in means, I'm gonna find that yes, the means are quite different which is my, why my p-values are tiny. So somehow I've like double dipped the data, but I didn't account for that in my analysis. And so we have a problem. So the question is how can we solve this problem through the lens of selective inference? Um, but actually before we bring out the big guns like selective inference, we can try to use sample splitting. So again, we have some da our data, we split it into a training set and a test set. We cluster the training set. And then what we need to do in order to to try out sample splitting is to apply those cluster labels to the test set. Um, so we need some way to take the orange and the green clusters obtained on the training set and apply them to the test set. There's a lot of ways we can think about doing this. Um, in order to make this figure, I use three nearest neighbor classification, where for each test set observation, I identified the three nearest observations on the training set. And then if the majority of them were orange, then I colored the test observation orange, and otherwise I colored it green. Um, but actually the details of how I do this labeling don't really matter. Uh, but the key point is that then if I conduct a hypothesis test for whether the orange and the green observations have the same mean on the test data, I still get a really, really small p-value, even though 
my original data didn't have any clusters. And so at first this seems really weird and it's sort of hard to wrap your head around because we're used to thinking that sample splitting is a get out of jail free card for us when we're dealing with double dipping. But actually, if you think about this, this problem a little bit more, you can see that the sample splitting doesn't actually help you. The reason that sample splitting doesn't help you is because in step three, when we label the test set using a classifier trained on the training set, um, in order to do that, we actually need to use the feature values for the test data. Like we need to use the horizontal and vertical positions for each of those test observations. So by doing that labeling, we're actually double dipping our test data. So in order to, to deal with this double dipping problem in, in clustering, sample splitting won't get us where we need to go. So we can think about doing this using a selective inference framework um, because sample splitting has an inflated type one error rate. Okay, so how can we solve this problem? Um, so let's phrase it a little more statistically. We're gonna let X be an N by Q data set. We wanna cluster the rows of X and we're gonna call those clusters C1 hat through CK hat where C1 hat contains the indices of the observations assigned to the first cluster and so on. And mu bar CK hat is gonna be the mean associated with the kth cluster. So it's just the, the mean of the, the population mean of the observations assigned to the kth cluster by my clustering algorithm. And I wanna test the null hypothesis that mu bar CK hat equals mu bar CK prime for two clusters K and K prime. Um, and this is kind of a weird question to be asking. And the reason that it's weird is because this null hypothesis is a function of the data, because you can see the null hypothesis involves CK K and CK prime, which were estimated from the data. So because the null hypothesis was obtained from the data, if I just compute like a traditional or a naive p-value, which is the probability under the null hypothesis of seeing such a big difference between the um, means of the kth and k prime clusters on the data, then I, that actually will not control the type one error rate. We'll get p-values that are too small even when, the, even when there's no signal on the data, even when there are no true clusters. So instead to, to get the selective inference framework to work, what I need to do is I need to condition on the thing that led me to be interested in this particular null hypothesis. So in this case, the only reason that I'm interested in testing the null hypothesis that the mean in the kth cluster equals the mean in the k prime cluster is because when I clustered the data, I got these two clusters. So that means that when I calculate a p-value, I should calculate a conditional on the fact that clustering the data gave me these two clusters. Because if clustering the data had given me two different clusters, then I never would have been asking about these two clusters in the first place. And so if I compute a p-value, that's just the probability of seeing such a big difference between these two clusters under the null hypothesis, given that clustering the data actually gave me these two clusters, then that p-value will control the type one error rate. In other words, it won't give me too many false rejections. Um, of course, just because you can write something down doesn't mean that it's easy to calculate. And in fact, coming up with an analytical expression for this p-value actually is the focus of our paper. Um, and it's very involved, um, but that's, that's really the idea. So we can see what happens if we apply this idea to some single cell RNA sequencing data. And um, single cell RNA sequencing, as you might know, is like really one of the most important technologies in, in genomics at the moment. And it provides us with a way to profile the expression or the activity levels of individual cells. So like old fashioned gene expression data, it was like you, you take a tissue sample and basically run it through a blender and you'd end up with like average expression across a huge number of cells that are in the tissue. But single cell data, you're actually profiling the expression of individual cells. So we took data from a paper published in Nature Communications a few years ago, um, which consists of a whole bunch of different immune cells. So there's T cells, B cells, and monocytes. So first we look at 600 T cells, and these are all T cells. So I suspect that there probably are not true clusters among the T cells because they're all T cells. And then we also look at 200 B cells, 200 T cells, and 200 monocytes. And I suspect that, that in that data set, there are going to be real clusters, because I think that probably each cell type should be its own cluster. So first I look at what I get if I just cluster the T cells. Um, the, the data is actually very high dimensional because of course um, there's tens of thousands of genes. Um, but here I'm just showing you the projection of the data onto the first two principal components. 
So if I cluster the data and then I project that data onto the first two principal components, I get the clusters shown in green, orange, and red, excuse me, green, blue, and red. And then if I compute p-values for a difference in means between each pair of clusters, that does not account for the fact that I did double dipping on my data, then I get very small p-values, less than 0.001. But if I apply my selective inference approach, I get much more modest p-values of around 0.7, which of course would not cause me to reject the null hypothesis. And to me, that makes sense because again, these are all T cells. So I think probably there aren't really true clusters in the data. So next I can look at the data consisting of 200 B cells, 200 memory T cells and 200 monocytes. And now when I cluster the data, I actually basically perfectly recover the true cell types. Um, but, but more importantly, if I perform an analysis that does not account for the fact that I double dipped in the data versus if I perform an analysis that does account for double dipping and that performs selective inference, what I find is that the p-values are actually almost indistinguishable and they're around 0.001. So I probably would um, reject the null hypothesis of no difference between the cluster means on, on this data, even if I properly account for the fact that I did double dipping. So this is really nice because it means that when there are no true clusters in the data, my selective inference p-values are able to determine that there's no true clusters. But when there are true clusters, I don't really pay a price for, for properly accounting for double dipping. So just very briefly, we also have some other applications or some other um, applications of the selective inference framework to, to some other problems that are of interest. So one problem we've thought about has to do with decision trees. Um, and so the idea behind a decision tree is that we have some data where here we just have two features, X1 and X2, with a bunch of observations. And the color of each observation represents the value of the response. And we fit a decision tree to the data, which looks something like this, where maybe if X1 is less than negative 9.2, then we predict one value of the response. And if it's greater than negative 9.2, we predict another value of the response. Um, and so where does double dipping come into this? Um, we'll suppose that I sample 100 observations from just a noise model. So there's no true signal here. And then I fit a decision tree to the data. What a decision tree really does is it just looks for, like it looks for either the horizontal or the vertical split to the data, such that the mean of the response on one side of the split and the mean of the response on the other side of the split are as different as possible. So here, that optimal split is shown as a red line. And that corresponds to this decision tree here, where we, we make a decision based on whether or not x1 is less than negative 9.2. And then we can ask the question, well, is the split that we discovered by fitting the decision tree, is this real? In other words, is there really a difference between the mean to the left and to the right of this red line? I know that the sample mean to the left of the red line is negative 0.92, and the sample mean to the right of the red line is 0.12. But what I don't know is if that's more different than I should expect by chance. Again, considering that I, I literally put that red line in the spot, it would make those two sample means look as different as possible. So if I just naively test the null hypothesis of no difference in means to the left and the right of the red line, then I get a very small p-value, even though I know that I just simulated this data under a noise model, and so the p-value just shouldn't be small. So to fix this, what I need to do is notice that just like a, a naive traditional p-value, it just calculates the probability under the null hypothesis of seeing such a big difference between the means between two terminal nodes in my decision tree will not control the type one error. So here, RA and RB represent the two terminal nodes in my decision tree. And so instead, what I need to do is condition on the fact that RA and RB were obtained from a tree. So I instead need to calculate the probability under the null hypothesis of seeing such a big difference in means between the two terminal nodes, given that these two terminal nodes actually are siblings in a decision tree. So in other words, I'm conditioning on what led me to actually test this null hypothesis. And if I do that, then I get type one error control. And so finally, one last example of this um, comes up in computational neuroscience. So here on the x-axis, I'm showing you time. And on the y-axis, I'm showing you calcium within a given neuron. And the idea here is that when a neuron um, spikes, like when a neuron fires, calcium enters. And therefore we can 
measure over time the calcium activity within a neuron, which is what's shown here. This is a time series showing a neuron's calcium content over time in order to uncover the times at which a neuron spiked. So our group has an algorithm to uncover the spike times on the basis of this type of calcium imaging data. And those spike times are shown as these little blue tick marks. So what we did here is we, we ran our algorithm, which sort of assumes that calcium decays exponentially over time in the absence of spikes to estimate the times at which a neuron spikes from calcium imaging data. And then we wanna ask a question, which is like, if we consider this particular spike, is this a real spike? Or, or did we just kind of like estimate a spike when there's actually noise in the data? So in other words, can we test the null hypothesis that there's really a spike here? And the problem is that we decided to test for the presence of the spike after estimating the spike here. Like the only reason I'm even wondering whether there's a real spike at this location is because my algorithm told me to estimate a spike at this location. So there's a double dipping problem in this data. And once again, we apply the selective inference framework to get around this issue. All right, so finally, just to wrap up, uh, returning to the replication crisis, um, I don't think the problem is p-values. Uh, maybe the problem is how we're doing data analysis, but I don't think the problem is p-values. Um, but I do think that there's a problem that we should be solving. Um, I don't think it's gonna help us to cancel p-values, um, but I think that what we do need to be aware of is the way in which we're doing double dipping in our analyses. And the reality is that most analyses are not accounting for double dipping because double dipping is hard to account for. Like in these three examples I told you about in the last 15 minutes of this talk, these, these selective inference solutions are like very bespoke. They're not, it's not just like a one size fits all solution that you can just like plug and chug to any problem. It requires actually like quite a bit of like, you know, algorithm development under the hood and exploiting the structure of these problems and so on. And so we do need a way to make it possible for people to account for double dipping in their analyses while maintaining power to reject the null hypothesis when indeed it doesn't hold. And the other thing that we need, this isn't really um, an ask for statisticians or for, for data analysts, but I think it just should be something about how we think about science. We need to have fewer headlines about a single study and more headlines about studies that have replicated across multiple, or rather findings that replicate across multiple studies. This, this, this should say findings that replicate across multiple studies. And we also need more resources to fund replication studies because a big problem that we have in science today is that like the initial study that's trying to show some new and shiny result can get funding from NIH, for example, but it's very, very hard to get funding for replication studies. And people who perform replication studies are typically not rewarded um, in terms of their career paths in the same way as the people who perform that new and shiny study that might turn out not to replicate. So just to close, I wanted to thank my wonderful co-authors and collaborators, um, Anna Neufeld and Yuchun Chen are current PhD students of mine at University of Washington. Lucy Gao and Sean Jewell are PhD alumni um, from 2020. And Jacob Yan is a longtime collaborator of mine since grad school, who is at the University of Southern California. Um, so thanks so much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you. It's, I'm the only one that can clap, so I'll take that responsibility seriously. It was extremely interesting. So there are a few questions in the chat already. Um, and so uh, no, two of the questions focused on what actually happens in the conditioning process for the cluster data, uh, what's involved mathematically and algorithmically. Is there anything that you can say on that that wouldn't get us too deep in the weeds? Oh, sorry, sorry that I was on mute. Let me try to give you sort of like the brief answer. So I think it it has to do with like right here, I said that we want to condition on the event that clustering the data gives me these two clusters. So first we can think about this just like really, really naively. Like if I have some model for X, then I could just like simulate a, a gazillion X's from this model. And then for each one, I could like cluster X and I could check whether it gave me CIK and CIK prime. And that would be like a Monte Carlo approach that would allow me to compute this conditional probability. But in practice, there's a ton of problems. One problem is that, of course, I don't know that the, the data generation, data generating distribution for X, it's not specified under my null hypothesis. To phrase that statistically, there's a lot of nuisance parameters. And then another issue is even if I didn't have nuisance parameters, that would be totally computationally intractable. So what I need to actually do is two things. I need to condition on a bit more information than what I've shown on this slide. 
So I'm actually not just going to condition on the fact that clustering X gives me CIK and CIK prime. I'm also going to condition on a little bit more in order to eliminate some nuisance parameters. And then what I'm going to need to do is like get into the weeds of how did I actually do the clustering so that I can exploit the algorithm of clustering in order to efficiently characterize this conditioning set. So in our paper, we did this for hierarchical clustering. And then I have another student who's currently working on the same thing for k-means clustering. Um, but this is what I what I meant when I said that like the 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 way to actually implement these selective inference approaches, it's it's like quite bespoke for each problem. It's not like a one size fits all thing because actually computing this conditional probability is very hard because the the conditioning set is quite involved. Thanks. So <clears throat> Maybe you could talk a little bit about the sociology of how statisticians should be involved in, 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 in uh, experimental research. So what's the right way for experimentalists to engage with, with statisticians to, you know, to, to, to do things correctly? Is there, yeah. Are there any things? Yeah. Well, I think it's a really, really hard problem. And like, you know, not so long ago, I mean, I guess decades ago, but not, not centuries ago, data sets were kind of small enough and simple enough that you could either like, as a non-statistician, you could either educate yourself enough in statistics that you could analyze your own data and it would all be fine. Or alternatively, you could just like bring in a statistical collaborator or consultant for, you know, just like the data analysis part of the project. And then in a few hours, they could like run some t-tests for you and you'd be done. And like, in my experience, that's not really how things work anymore. Like in the, in the areas that my collaborators work, like in genomics and neuroscience, like they're collecting huge amounts of data with very, very, very complicated experimental and computational pipelines. And the amount of expertise that you need either to collaborate as a statistician on those projects, um, or alternatively for you as an experimental researcher to develop the statistical expertise, it's just not, it's just not feasible in either direction. And I think that in large part, like that is what's fueling the lack of re replicability, replication in science is that um, like, the, the people who have the expertise to understand the statistics are often not the same as the people who have the expertise to understand the experiments. And there's just not enough people who have both areas of expertise. So I think we're gonna need to find a way to um, reward interdisciplinary work in a way that is often not rewarded. Because right now for like a statistician, that you, you like don't get a job in a top stat department by exclusively focusing on like analyzing other people's data. And similarly, you don't get a job in like a top biology department if you spend all of your time like turning into a statistician as opposed to doing biology. And so we need a way to encourage people to develop both skill sets or to alternatively um, encourage like team science in a way that right now we pay lip service to, but we're not actually encouraging in terms of like academic career trajectories or funding. So I don't, I don't have any good answers other than to say that it is a really hard problem. But, but throwing away p-values isn't going to help. I mean, we can, we can like lay all the blame on p-values and then in 10 years, we won't have p-values anymore, but we'll still be right where we are right now. So maybe worse because we won't have p-values. So in the chat, there are a number of questions about selective inference. Um, one question is what happens when the selective inference problems haven't been solved analytically? Sort of what's the right approach, permutation testing? So. Yeah, so I, that's a good question. I don't think about permutation testing as helping me with selective inference. And I'm sorry to the person in the chat if I'm just not understanding how permutation testing would help right now. Um, but I think the one thing that can sometimes help is sample splitting. So like in the examples that I talked about today, I had like the regression example, the clustering example of decision trees and computational neuroscience. And so in two of those examples, sample splitting would help. So in both regression and decision trees, you could kind of get like a quick and dirty solution to those problems using sample splitting. But in clustering and the computational neuroscience one, like straight up sample splitting wouldn't, wouldn't solve the problem for you. So, so the point is sometimes sample splitting will help and sometimes it won't. And I think when it doesn't, maybe we need to ask ourselves, like is the analysis that we're trying to do really okay? Or do we need to just like not ask that question? So maybe there's some exploratory data analysis that we actually shouldn't be using to motivate our hypothesis, the hypotheses that we're gonna test. But again, that's really easy for me to say as a statistician, it's much, much harder to convince someone of that who spent like the last five years collecting a data set to be like, mm, I understand why you're interested in that question. I see why that question looks really interesting based on your data, 
but unless you spend another five years collecting more data, you just can't ask it. That's just going to be a really tough sell for um, someone who's who's not a statistician. And I think that's something that we also as statisticians need to realize is that there's a difference between like what we feel is right statistically and what's like a reasonable ask for our collaborators. And we really should be trying to um, help bridge that gap. Maybe one more question from, from myself. Are there any academic subcultures, scientific subcultures where they get the structural understanding of hypotheses right? I mean, are there areas that sort of have really good practices, maybe because they have a, hot, a large number of statisticians talking to them? So. Well, actually, that, I think there's a lot. That's a, that's a great question, but I think there's a lot. And for me, like one example, so this entire field of multiple testing, I mean, a lot of ideas of multiple testing are, you know, from the, well before the year 2000, but actually within the field of statistics, a lot of people became interested in multiple testing due to the field of genomics because people started collecting gene expression data. And at first there was chaos and people were testing 20,000 hypotheses and not doing any kind of multiple testing correction. And then it became clear within the field of genomics that like order had to be brought to the chaos. And so a lot of statisticians got involved and also people in the field of genomics became much, much, much better informed about these issues. And now today, like if you talk to someone who's a researcher in genomics, then like my experience is, these are people who now are like extremely computationally savvy and like really understanding multiple, like the basics of multiple testing extremely well, understand, you know, family wise error rate, understand false discovery rate. And that's really kind of like a success story. So you no longer see these like naive kind of errors in genomics, um, like in that XKCD article, which, which you saw those errors 20 years ago and you really don't see them now. Of course, like there's always new errors to be made, but, but like the, the, the low hanging fruit, I think, is like no longer there in genomics in terms of like basic multiple testing issues. However, there are other fields that are still making those sort of simpler multiple testing mistakes. Um, and I think it's just a matter of over time when, when people in that field realize that this is an issue, I think like sooner or later, there will be a move to make sure that, that those issues are, are addressed in, in published papers. I don't think throwing away p-values will get us there though. So there's actually a question from uh, Orestes Panagiotou, who you quoted. So I think I should, I should read the question. So, um, so the question is, currently the recommendation to ban p-values comes mostly from epidemiologists. How should the statistical community respond to that? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think I, I'm pretty puzzled by a lot of the, <laughs> the calls to abandon p-values. I'm not quite sure that it's mostly coming from epidemiologists. I think that it's coming from a lot of fields but I will say there's like, a, in my experience, there's a very high correlation between like an opinion piece coming out saying we should ban p-values and then like the second paragraph of the opinion piece having completely the wrong definition for a p-value. So on the one hand, like it's very easy to laugh as I am and sort of like dismiss some of these complaints. But on the other hand, of course, like if there's a pattern then you should pay attention to what the pattern is. And here there's a pattern of evidence that we as statisticians haven't done a good job explaining these sort of fundamental statistical concepts. And on the one hand, it's very easy to say, well, like statistics is hard and it's hard for people to understand these ideas and it's not our fault. But on the other hand, we also as a field could be trying a little bit harder to make some of these ideas a little bit um, more transparent. And like, for example, I love that XKCD comic because it's like, this isn't rocket science. Like, I think that you don't need to have like a ton of statistical expertise to like see what the problem is in that, in that comic. That should be funny to even a non-expert. And so I think that we as statisticians should do a little bit better to um, explain to people what we're doing so that they have less of an opportunity to, to mischaracterize it and then tell us that it's worthless. Yes, green, green jelly beans are in fact safe, even to for <laughs> well, well, I mean, they're fine for acne, but they're very dangerous for cancer, so. I see. Well, thank you very much. This has been a wonderful, um, a, a wonderful presentation, both touching on mathematical sciences issue, but a bigger picture. Um, so I'm going to, to, to call this an evening. Uh, so we're grateful for all the people that have joined this, this, this presentation. I'm sure we'll be having more presentations, both virtually, but maybe even some in person as part of our public lecture series. So stay tuned, follow us over social media, read our announcements, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Thanks so much, Brandon, and to all of you. Take care, everyone. Good night.